Awesome. The scriptures have a lot to say about pride. And we can, we can start in the Old Testament with a guy named Job. Job, he's such a compassionate figure, or a, uh, a figure we have such compassion for, I should say. But in the midst of the book of Job, he spends several chapters defending his innocence before God. He was righteous in his own eyes, the text says. And, and in the midst of this conversation between Job and his friends, God breaks into the middle of this and he says, hey, can I speak now? A and when God is done with Job, Job says, I had no idea what I was talking about. And at the end of the book, in chapter 42, he says, But now my eyes have seen you, Lord. Therefore, I take back my words and depend, uh, repent in dust and ashes. Isaiah, he was a great servant of God, very boldly went out to the people, very confidently went to them and urged them to repent from their sin. But when Isaiah found himself in the very presence of God, his worthiness was really small, and all he could utter was, Woe to me, I am ruined. King Nebuchadnezzar, in the book of Daniel, he found out how much God opposes the proud. He was very full of himself, and, and he said this in chapter 4, is this not Babylon the great that I have built by my vast power to be a royal residence and to display my majestic glory? A rhetorical question, of course, on the king's part. But God answered him swiftly and he said, you are going to be dethroned. And not only that, you're going to go into the wilderness and you're going to live more like an animal than like a human being. God wanted him to acknowledge the Father in a rightful way. And, and, and after his time in the wilderness, Nebuchadnezzar came back and he said this, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven, because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. There are over 100 verses in the Bible that talk about pride, and you can guess that none of the references are positive ones. We can look just in, in the Psalms and the Proverbs and pick out a few. Psalm 101.5, whoever has haughty eyes and a proud heart, I will not tolerate. Proverbs 11.2, when pride comes, then, <clears throat> then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. Proverbs 16.19 finally says, Better to be lowly in spirit along with the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. You best not be counted among the proud when you're standing in front of God. And so here's Jesus in our parable today, and I'm imagining the scene as, as, as his audience is kind of politely gathered around, perhaps sipping their morning coffee and wondering, what's Jesus going to talk about today? Well, Luke describes the audience, if we go to the text, Luke 18, verse 9. And Luke says, Jesus also told this parable to some who were confident that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. So these guys were feeling pretty good about themselves. They were confident 
and they tended to look down on others. And Jesus tells them this story. Verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed about himself like this. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, extortionists, unrighteous people, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. Now, his, his audience was comprised of Pharisees, and I'm thinking at this point, they're probably wondering, ah, where, where's Jesus going with this story? Getting a little bit uncomfortable, perhaps. Now, I, I have an object lesson here today, and w w what, uh, what this is, is uh, these, they're, and I don't know if the, the camera will pick this up much, but I have three glasses up here, and each glass represents uh, a person or a, a person with a, a, a type of attitude. And so this first glass is like the Pharisee. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this water here, and we're going to fill this up. We're going to fill it all the way to the brink here. And it's, it's filled up because, like the Pharisee, this guy's kind of full, right? He's, he's got the answers. He's, he's found Jesus. It's hard for him to learn anything new. He's got the answers. He knows right from wrong. He knows what to do. It's a religious guy. Problem is, it's, it's a dangerously proud and often blind posture. And, and what tends to happen with this guy is if he tries to ingest something new that, that challenges him or, or, or somebody calls him out on his self-righteousness, it, it tends to not go that well and we, we get a, a little bit of a mess. Right? Goes, goes overflowing. So that's the Pharisee. Well, let's return to the text then. And so Jesus continues with his story in verse 13. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Well, the text doesn't say what their reaction was, but I'm kind of thinking there's sort of this awkward silence maybe as they file out of the building. A and then someone breaks the silence and says, a tax collector? Are you kidding me? He's justified before God? How could this be? He's an extortionist. He, he runs around working for the Roman government. Who, who does Jesus think he is? Now, the, the Pharisees in the first century, they, they were educated guys. They, they knew the scriptures, right? Uh, but they, they, were, they, they knew that pride wasn't right. They knew the stories of Job and Isaiah and all the rest. They, they'd read uh, the Psalms. They... They know all this stuff, but see, they didn't see themselves that way. They, they were blind to it. And, and so here we sit in the 21st century. Pride is still with us. 
I, I'll confess right now that I can be prideful. And, and the thing about pride is it's a sin that's very insidious. You, I, I don't normally know that I'm being prideful until afterwards. And, and, and sometimes maybe I catch myself just, just after I say or do something or have that prideful thought in my, in my mind. And, and sometimes it might be, you know, a few days later or a few weeks or, or maybe looking back several years and saying, oh, wow, yeah, I, I was kind of full of myself on, on that one. Sometimes somebody points it out to me. But it, it's a sin that is often difficult for us to recognize. You guys are familiar with the George Barna group. Well, they did a survey a couple of years ago, and the intent of the survey was to try to see where uh, American Christians were in terms of whether their actions and attitudes reflected more closely uh, the actions and attitudes of Jesus or the actions and attitudes of the Pharisees as are described in the Bible. And what they found out is that of uh, self-described evangelical Christians that took the survey, 38% of them were found to be more like the Pharisees in their actions and attitudes. And I, and I think we're in too big of a crowd today for you and I to say, ah, you know, that 38% is somebody else. The fact of the matter is that we struggle with this issue. And I think probably all of us can say that at some level we do. Well, let's, let's look at the second glass here. And so th this glass kind of represents the unchurched guy. A a and this guy, he, he's pretty confident, maybe really confident in his position that th there really isn't an all-powerful creator of the universe that's, that's uh, involved in our lives and in the world around us. He's pretty confident of that. And, and so when, when this guy, when, when God is at work around this guy's life, it, it just kind of bounces off, right? Because, look, it's, it's not a water problem, it's a posture problem, because if you can't see, the glass is upside down. So nothing, of course, can go in, it just bounces out. And the interesting thing is, the capacity of this glass is the very same as this one. It's not a water problem, it's a posture problem. And see... Again, this guy's confident, this guy's confident. They're both confident in their position. One is religious, one secular. We'll come back to the table one more time. Let's go back and, and uh, look at verse 14 for a minute. In verse 14, it says, the tax collector went home justified before God. Now, justification, I it's a word that refers to the idea of having right legal standing before God. And as we look at scripture, it's clear that justification comes through faith. And in fact, we, we can go all the way back to Genesis, and we can see this. And if we look at Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, it says this, And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. An author by the name of Stan Guthrie Speaking of this verse, in his book called 66 Verses, says this, 
It's a pivotal moment in the history of salvation, revealing how God graciously deals with his people. The verse and subsequent scripture make it clear. Justification comes through faith. You ever wonder why that might be? Well, there's a theologian by the name of Wayne Grudem who answered or, or asked this question. He posed this question in a, in a book a few years back. And, and Grudem says the answer is this, that faith is the one attitude of the heart that is the exact opposite of depending on ourselves. When we come to Christ in faith, we essentially say, I give up. I will not depend on myself or on my own good works any longer. But see, prideful people trust in their own abilities and achievements. And so do you see how this puzzle fits together? See, pride is a very effective roadblock to faith and dependence on God. And that's why God opposes it so greatly. And, and, of course, in this parable, Jesus sets up the very stark contrast of these two characters, the very prideful Pharisee and the very humble tax collector. And, and I think the Pharisees in the first century that were listening to that parable live as Jesus told it, I think they understood the message, but they they were a bit blind to it. And, and I don't think they actually accepted the message and carried it out. You know, today we have access to all kinds of resources. We have Bibles everywhere in the United States of America. We've we've got uh, resources, there's great books at the Christian bookstore, there's, there's online stuff, podcasts, uh, online sermons. If you don't like mine today, go watch another one later today, right? There, there are tons of resources. We've never had it better in terms of being able to understand the messages that God is giving to us. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we allowing those resources, and in particular the resource of the Word of God itself, to actually transform us? Author Francis Chan says this, Unfortunately, we've conditioned ourselves to hear messages without responding. You know, too often I think we engage in what I call passive disobedience to the hard teachings of the Word of God. And, and this is a really dangerous habit for us to get into. It can stunt our spiritual growth. It can kill the joy of living the Christian life. It can block the work of the Holy Spirit that lives within you if you're a believer. And it can kill the mission of the church, not just this church, but any church. Now, passive disobedience is what's happening when, when this guy here, the religious guy, it, it's, what's, it's, it's what's happening when this guy uh, d decides to deny the conviction that he has to give more generously of his time, his talents, his treasure for eternal things. I it's what's happening when this guy decides that maybe God doesn't quite understand the human complexity or the complexity of human relationships when he tells us to love our enemies. I it's what's happening when this guy decides, you know, it's a little bit difficult and, and kind of uncomfortable, and I don't really like investing in unchurched, immoral people. I, I, I'm just going to spend my time serving others in the church. Now, look, 
We want you to, you are, it's biblical to serve people in the church, to serve one another and, and build each other up. We have to do that. But, but we can't then say, well, I'm just going to do that. I'm going to, it's a specialty. I'm going to specialize in that. And, and I'm, and I'm, I'm not going to go out and be salt and light in the world because if you're not willing to invest in that guy, then how are you going to be salt and light to him? How are you going to bring the gospel to him if you're not willing to do that? Well, we could go on with probably some more examples, but I think you get the idea of what I'm saying. Now, Let's continue in the, in the text. There's, there's another small parable here that follows immediately after this one. We start in verse 15. It says, People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. So Jesus kind of dismisses the disciples' concern. He says, come on, bring... Bring the little children, bring the babies to me. I want to bless them. And then he makes a pretty straight-up factual statement. The kingdom of God belongs to little children like these. A and Jesus helps them to understand the gravity of what he's saying when he explains that anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom as a little child will what? Never enter it. His statement is all about exalting the humility of a small child. You see, a small child much more readily accepts the gospel. He or she is, is excited to receive a gift like that. Think about an infant. They're, they're totally unencumbered by pride because they're totally dependent beings. And parents of babies know this. I mean, what happens when, when they have a need? Uh, all they know is they have a need. They don't even fully understand it. But what do they do? They, they cry out. They say, Mom, Dad, help, I'm hungry. They cry out to the one that cares for them like the tax collector cried out to God in his utter dependence. Pride's not an issue for a baby. You know, in the first century, children didn't have great status. But what Jesus was saying is that you don't come into the kingdom through your status. It's not by virtue of your wealth, your power, your achievements or abilities, your talents. It doesn't matter. No, you come through humility. And pride, Jesus is saying here, makes it not just difficult, but apparently impossible. I mean, he says, you will never enter it. Wow. But God can grow us into close relationship with him if we are willing to receive him in humility. And the last glass here... We'll call it the, the humble glass, I guess. So, so this one, it, it's partly filled, right? And so this, this guy or gal, they, they have Jesus, but they know they don't know it all. They know they're a work in progress. They know it's not what they've done yesterday or today or last year. That that doesn't matter. That, that it's only through Christ 
faith in him and his sacrifice for us that they are saved. And, and this person is, is willing to learn, willing to give. So if, if this guy, the young church guy, ever opens up to the gospel, they're, they're ready to pour in and invest in that guy. They can invest in the, you know, other believers, right? And, and they still have, well, I don't have much water left, but they, they still have what they have. And, and they're, you know, they're ready to, to learn again and be, be discipled and grow some more. They're ready to receive what God is wanting to teach them from day to day. And it's folks like this that build a healthy church body. Let's be people that are like this last glass. Uh, an author by the name of Matt Hurd wrote a book called Life with a Capital L. And he says this. At the root of my refusal to benefit from the light of his word is sheer pride. Letting God illuminate my path requires humility, an admission that he knows better than I what will fulfill me. It will involve submission to his way over my way. Folks, let us not pour over the scriptures, but fail to live out the gospel. And, and let us not accumulate Bible facts, but fail to experience the supernatural power of God's word in our lives. As I prepared this message and, and reflected on uh, all, all of what, what the Lord is trying to say to us here, uh, I, I found a few practical applications for myself, and I'll share them with you. First, I, I feel like I need to focus more on my sin than anyone else's sin. You know, sometimes we get into that mode of thinking where we're sort of pointing at the other guy. I, I need to examine my thoughts, my attitudes, my actions, take them to God and, and confess and repent as needed and, and try to root out the pride that gets in the way of following Jesus more closely. Secondly, I need to ask God to help me not lose sight of the fact that I'm justified before him only through faith. It's not anything that I do. It's not anything that you do. It is only through faith. And, and lastly, I, I need to ask God to help me serve him in humility each day. And, and so whether I'm over here and I, I, I serve him in such a way that I get accolades and attaboys, I need to serve him humbly and say, I, I'm, not, I'm not in it for what the men and women around me think about it. I'm in it for your glory, your praise, God. And, and whether I'm over here and I'm serving in complete anonymity, I'm doing something that, that, that either nobody knows about or nobody cares about, it, it's, it's difficult, it's, it's unpleasant, but, but yet it's something that I'm called by the Lord to serve. Well, I'll serve him humbly in that. And so, Lord, help me to, to be humble in this and humble in this kind of service as well. And, and of course, what we see in the life of Christ is humility exemplified. He came to serve. He, 
he, he lowered himself from great, great status to serve us and to sacrifice for us. It was literally the hallmark of his life here on earth, humility. And he is our example. <clears throat> well, as we get set to close here, I, I certainly want to invite you to respond to the Lord in your heart in whatever way. Uh, but but I'd also say that, that there'll, there'll be a couple of elders in the back corner over there that, that if you feel like for whatever reason you want to uh, uh, talk to someone or, or, or pray with them about a situation in your life, I want you to encourage to do that. So bow with me. <clears throat> Father, may this message be one that we not just hear without responding, but that we would indeed respond. We would seek to root out the pride in our lives. Uh, like Job, we would admit that sometimes we have no idea what we're talking about. And like Isaiah, that sometimes we're just so small in front of you, your greatness. And, and like the tax collector, may we be humble enough to bow down at your throne and say, I am a sinner. Have mercy on me. And knowing confidently that you in your graciousness, will accept us. We're, we will be justified before you. We know this from your word. We thank you for that. Father, I, I pray that we would walk out of here today uh, committed to this, that we would grow in humility, and, and, and as we grow in humility, that we would grow in trust. That is our prayer. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I'll admit, I'm, I'm proud today. <laughs> I'm proud of my staff, guys, and uh, proud of David. And, uh, you know, I, I told you, I think, once before I walk in mornings and I say, hello, son, how are you? And uh, he was born when I was 10 years old. But, uh, and, uh, but I'm proud of my staff, guys, and, and Dave, and the work you're doing with the children and so on, and Tim, and with our small groups and people in need and crises and Trent with our teens, he just loves our teens and uh, Chris with our young adults and all that he does with our teaching and, and, and ministry here. So, so thankful for, for the guys. Um, as we, as we just uh, are dismissed with one final prayer, uh, there's just uh, some people in, in need particularly. Uh, we'll just mention that you really be in prayer for Maureen Whitmer. We shared with you last week, uh, a rather dreadful sort of cancer has, has fallen upon her. Um, it's a bile duct cancer, and it's uh, uh, spread to the liver, 